Hello and welcome to Conversations. Oh, we've got a hair-raising tale for you today. Peter Fitzsimons is here to tell you a really gruesome story of betrayal, sexual slavery, shipwreck and mass murder. And the thing is, it's a true story and an Australian one too, because it happened just off our coastline. It's the story of the Batavia, the Dutch ship that was wrecked on a reef near the WA coast, way, way back in the year 1629. On board the ship, the Batavia, there were caskets of gold and silver coins, there were soldiers and families too, and one of the most beautiful women in Holland. And they were all on their way to the Dutch spice trading citadel of Batavia on Java. When the ship hit a reef, the passengers were marooned on a few tiny reef islands, and then they were left at the mercy of one of the officers, who was an honest-to-God murdering psychopath. Peter Fitzsimons has told this story, even though he normally has no stomach for such things and would rather lounge about studying the poetry of Keats or the monarch butterfly. Nonetheless, he took a deep breath, plunged right in, and he's written the book called Batavia. Peter Fitzsimons, welcome back to Conversation, sir. Thank you. Nice to be here. What a great tale. There'll never be a better one, and I'm not just saying that as marketing shtick. From the moment I came across it, um, it was well, very well known in Western Australia, but in 1999, I was having lunch with my publishers after I'd, in fact, I think I'd f- just finished the Beasley book, or recovering from having done the Beasley book, and they said, next project. And I said, well, what will I do? And they said, well, what about Batavia? And that was 99. Had you and heard of it then? Never heard of it. And I went to went back to the Sydney Morning Herald where I work and got the files cut out and just was engrossed with this stuff. And my, my first feeling was, who's been keeping this a secret? How is it that I like Australian history and, you know, I read reasonably widely? Um, I love stories. How is it that I never heard about this? And, and anyway, I did a uh, 25,000 word synopsis for the publishers within about three or four or five weeks, sent it. And it was one of those reply to all because my... Publisher Alison Urquhart, she meant to forward it to the the big publisher, and it was something like, "I think this poor bugger thinks this is a synopsis, but gee, it's a good story." Yeah. <laughs> First time I'd ever done a synopsis, and it went back and forth over the next eleven years. And about a year, year or two ago, or whatever it was, I got serious and then got into it and and started to to flesh it. It's it's if it can be characterised as anything in TV terms, it's a like Dexter goes to Gilligan's Island. <laughs> that's that's my uh, story. Now it's it, and it's it is a true. Story story, but it, it seems so strange and gruesome and bizarre. What are the historical records on like Okay, this? there are two... Uh, it can be verified? Absolutely. I mean, the first, the first one of these, the first version of this story... Uh, came out in 1647 in Holland and it was an immediate bestseller. It gripped people. And there was in Australia in 1898, so there were various versions in Europe and the Dutch version was picked up by a Dutch-Australian, Wilhelm Sibinar, and he got it, well, he got a hold of it and... uh, in fact, no, I've got it. 1898, and a, a very rich Perth man, businessman, came back with the copy, gave it to a Dutch Australian who translated it. And so it was uh, then appeared in the Western Mail, which is the the uh, forerunner to the what you and I know as the West Australian, and it was published. Yeah, and but what are the, what are the uh, direct first-person okay, records? Two, the two documents are what's known as the Predicant's Letter, which is the Predicant was the preacher on the island. He lost all of his family bar one on the island. So he was with his wife and six children. His wife and the five five of the children were killed, murdered. Only the beautiful daughter and he were the ones to survive. When he got back, when he got back to Batavia, which we, you and I now know as Jakarta, he wrote a long letter to his family in Holland describing what's happened. So that's the first of the primary documents. The other one is Pelsart's journal. So Pelsart being the commander, the admiral, who not only was on the ship when it hit the reef, then gone for help. But the most important thing is when he got back, without ruining my story now, yeah. he there was testimony of everybody that was involved. There was and an inquiry. Of, there was of a the serious inquiry lasting for weeks. We're under torture. I mean, it was the first version of waterboarding, and all of that testimony has survived. You know what? It strikes me. It's one of those stories. It reminds me of one like Shakespeare's darkest plays. Mm. Like, and That's I think right. Shakespeare was still alive at the time too. Mm. So it's, it's a shame you never got to write a play around it. Mm. Where, where for a while it's like King Lear or yeah. Macbeth, where yes. evil gets right off the leash, yeah. has its way for a long time. 
and wait and until the forces of good, if you yeah. like, can marshal their strength and then run run over it again. Yeah. Let's 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 start right at the beginning okay. of this tale. The spice trade. We have to start with the spice trade. Inter- in- the biggest trade in the world mm. at the time. It seems spices seem like a kind of trivial luxury to us. Why were they so important to people in the 1600s? And once again, I knew nothing about that until I started researching it, and I was stunned by how sophisticated it was. And broadly, there were the Spice Islands, and these were tiny, tiny little specks specks of land uh, that were about 10 days' sail to the east of the eastern tip of what you and I now know as Indonesia, but was then the Dutch East Indies. And it was from here that all came all the nutmeg and the cinnamon and the spices that were so coveted in Europe. Why were they so coveted? Because, well, one reason was you put them on your food. There's, there's been a lot of historical discussion about whether or not it could preserve food, you know, rotting meat, and there's, the historians seem evenly divided on that. But it was, they, a lot of people believed it was an aphrodisiac. So there was a, there was a, there was a, no, there was a big market. Others believed that it could cure just about any ills whatsoever. But everybody agreed that putting it on, the, on food, preparing it right, made food just wonderful. And the point of it was that from those Spice Islands, if you could get an ounce of that for whatever price you could pay, you could sell it at a 600 times markup back in Europe. So you, you got, get it into Amsterdam or you got it into Rome or wherever. The two, the two entry points basically for, for many centuries were Constantinople, Istanbul and Venice. And so they, those were the two that controlled it. And what was interesting, again, I knew nothing about this, but for centuries and centuries and centuries, it had travelled, the, the spices had travelled overland from trader to trader to trader. And what, the, what, from the East Indies into that's China? Right, that's right. Then across Central Asia? All of that. The Silk, I think all, they called the it the Silk Road. Road yeah. all and then it. up to Venice. Yeah. Or and what yeah. that meant was that everybody would take a tithe. As I sell it to you and for a certain amount. You sell it on. And by the time, everybody got a profit. And what drove... Look at me sounding like a maritime expert. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm not. But I love I loved this story. What drove the maritime powers to go further and further afield was to realise that if we can get our ships to these spots, islands wherever they are if we can get there and get the spices into the hold of our ship we'll make the profit and that's what powered the dutch east indies company which was the first multinational company in the world and the first company to ever divvy up shares now now it was called a company because Hmm. it was a company of friends and associates wasn't it that's right and it's the first form of modern capitalism it was and this and they had the first in holland in amsterdam they had the first share market so it was that i will buy from the company 50 50 50 divisions of this company, this Dutch East Indies company, and I'll get a receipt. Now, if you want to buy, you can buy my receipt. And that was like the first trade in shares and you could get dividends. And it was all very sophisticated. And and one part I didn't put in the book, I just didn't have the space. But the first time that somebody was selling short, invented the whole rorting system, happened three (laughs) years after. Three years after they invented the share market, they worked out how to cheat on it. And so all of these maritime powers, so Portugal was very strong. Spain was very strong, um, and they would go further and further down the coast of Western Africa to try to get around the tip, to get, try to get around the southern tip. Finally, finally they did, but it was the Dutch in, uh, in the early 1600s who, who really started to propel across, across the Indian Ocean. And right. what was interesting, in the, the usual way for many, many decades, was once you got past the southern tip of Africa, you'd go up and you'd always stay in sight of the coast. Right, you'd hug the coast up uh, East Africa. Mad- Madagascar Straits, up uh, Zanzibar, all of that. up around to, to India then. Yes. But, but the Dutch explorers found yeah. a quick a quick. Uh, and this guy, I, uh, This guy, your Dutch Australian listeners will shoot me for my pronunciation or my pronunciation, one of those two. Or I think it's Andrik Brewer, captain. And in 1611, he was the first to go, look, instead of hugging the coastline, let's just go out straight out in the ocean and see if there are some winds. And within two days... Pushka, hit by the roaring 40s, and they're propelled across the Indian Ocean at a, at, a, at a speed never before thought possible. And so that began what was known as Brewer's Route, was don't hug the coast. You want to get to the capital of the Dutch East Indies, which is Batavia, which is now Jakarta. This is the way to go. You basically roar across for 30 days, work out, you basically get within sight of what the, what the Dutch called Het Zwiedland, the Southland, Australia, and then go put, turn to port, turn okay. to turn to starboard. So, so if you'd be going across the Indian Ocean, yes. or you catching the Roaring Forties, you'd be leaping across at a great rate of knots, yes. as you say. And if you kept going, 
you'd you run can, bang straight, straight into the middle of yes, the West Australian yes. coast, somewhere near where Geraldton, between Geraldton that's, and Carrara. That's right, and now. well, in Dirk Hartog Island being the being right. the, being the pertinent one particularly. And again, so I you'd, you'd have to pull up short then yeah. and take a left turn. That's right. Head, that's exactly right. right. And it killed me to like when you get to the end of a book, you've got to make space. And I had to cut out a lot of stuff that I loved. But the uh, the uh, the the the, is it the Zeitdorp? I'm not sure how to pronounce it. The 1606, the first time the Dutch landed on on Australian soil. And again, I was I saw a thing on a current affairs show not long ago, and the reporter said something like, "And there are reports that before Captain Cook, of course, the Dutch were here." Hang on, mate. Reports? <laughs> they were all over the joint. And and I love the part in 1606. The uh, Doifkin, that's the one I'm thinking of. The Doifkin landed on the, the, think of Cape York, the Western Cape, or part of Cape York. That was the first time documented that the Dutch actually came well, ashore. Well, oh, the Dutch, yeah. Mm. There is some evidence that, we won't spend too much time mm. on this, but there is some evidence the Portuguese got Yes, down in Melbourne. The, down, yeah. down, 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 I love that story yeah, too. that's yeah. a great story. So well, I, can, I can say this though, when I was doing this book, it, I, a Dutch maritime expert showed me the map of Australia that the Dutch had in 1770 when Captain Cook got there. And what it showed was from the tip of date to Cape York down to the Gulf of Carpentaria, all around Western Australia, Great Australian Bight to Port Phillip Bay. All of that the Dutch had mapped. The only part that was not mapped was the east coast of Australia, and that's what Captain Cook found. Right. Uh, Peter Fitzsimons is with me at the moment, and he's been practising his Dutch accent (laughs) for today. He's not doing too badly either. His latest book is the true and gruesome story of the Batavia, the ship that got wrecked off the coast of WA in 1629. So so the the mission of the Batavia then, Peter, was to take a whole lot of things Mm. all the way from Holland to the new Dutch citadel, of Batavia, yes, the place we now recognise as Jakarta, Jakarta, the city mm, of Jakarta. That's right. Now, now uh, what was on board the Batavia? There was what you and I now know as Southeast Asia. It was the Dutch East Indies, and so there was this extraordinarily sophisticated trading empire, whereby the Dutch, almost in the manner of lorries, you know, travelling all across Australia and getting potatoes from Dubbo and dropping them off in Melbourne, and taking taking uh, corn from somewhere else. So these Dutch ships and Batavia, the township of Batavia, was like the trading dip, depot depot. And so all they would get silk from China, they'd get porcelain from Japan, they'd get textiles from India, and it's just going back and forth and back and forth. And that is the capital. So Jakarta, Batavia is the capital. And so in this Dutch ship, Batavia, in the hold, you had 12, the operative thing is you had 12 money chests, chocker with silver coins, okay? Now, by one report, the the greatest assembly, and one Dutch historian uh, pointed this out to me, said it was the greatest assembly of treasure, of, of capital, in the one place at on. one time that had ever left Holland. They put it on a boat. They put it on a boat. On because, a boat that could very well have hmm, sunk, too. I mean, it was almost, you know, those armor guard. It was almost yeah. an armor guard van taking it to take, <laughs> taking <laughs> it to the capital because this would what, with what, with those silver coins, they would pay, they'd pay their, uh, their soldiers They'd pay their people. Um, It'd be something that was a universally recognised symbol of trade. And they also had, obviously, they had they had a lot of things, fine furniture for the the officials in in Batavia. Um, They had wonderful textiles, silk, cloth, velvet. They had wine, fine wine, wine, lots and lots of wine, lots of wine. And if you go on the replica of the ship, the Batavia, up at Lestad, in uh, just north of Amsterdam. It's it's wonderful because you're on this this construction that is a, is a replica, but 400 years ago, how sophisticated it was and how far they could go, and it was like in a way state of the art was it for its absolute time? state of the art. And one thing that stunned me when I began was the uh, that replica when it came into Sydney Harbour in 1999 after voyaging, coming all the way from Holland, they could only get it under the Harbour Bridge at low tide. Because the mast was... That, isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing that mankind... The mast was that tall. Ma- was that tall. That a mankind, timber mast. A timber mast. That mankind... I know, it sounds... That's, it stunned me yeah. too. 400 years ago, mankind was making a ship big enough that the mast was that high that it couldn't get under the Sydney Harbour Bridge unless it was at low tide. And so this ship, this Batavia ship, it's got 331 people on board. The setup is that down in the... There's basically three levels. And broadly, broadly, the more elite you are in the hierarchy, in the command structure, the higher you are and the further to the back of the ship you are. It's like in the old days at Channel 9. 
Kerry Packer's office is there. <laughs> if, you're, if you're one along, you're doing real well. If you're three or four floors down in the dungeon. So it was all about the most comfortable place on the ship was at the top and at the back. Okay, so the Batavia is taking all these luxury goods. Yes. And all these chests of coin mm. and... On board there are soldiers. 100 soldiers, and they are the lowest of the low. They're down below, so they're in the darkness and the filth, and they're, basically their job is partly, really what they're going out to do is to man the barracks, to, to the attrition rate. But the, there, are, there are families there as well? There are, there are. There Kids. are. There, and they're basically one level up. There are about 20, 25 women. There are a, a gaggle of kids, a few babies, because they're also taking out, they were also taking out passengers, simple paying passengers who were going out to the Dutch East Indies. And it was a thing, the common, the common thread of most of those on board was desperation. You wouldn't actually get on a ship like that. The attrition rates were so fearful, the voyage so long, so, you know, the problems with scurvy and pestilence disease uh, were, so, were so fearful that it was really a collection, apart from the elite at the top and the back of the ship, most of the rest were desperate. And so you had to, the soldiers, they were, mer well, basically mercenaries, but in the, in the employ of the VOC, they weren't simply Dutchmen, they were all also, uh, there were a lot of Germans. There was one Englishman. If we, if we, if I get this up for a Hollywood film, I think I'm going to have to find an, Amer <laughs> find an American there. It's the families I really think about too, when yeah. you start particularly. I mean, all of them, but but uh, the, brave enough to pick up everything and try and make it, and not thinking that things could go bad, but not having any idea of how bad things yeah. would actually get. Peter. Now let's talk about the commander Pelsart. Now, commander Francisco Pelsart. Now he's not. A Navy guy, is he? He's no. Not, he's, he's no. not actually the skipper, but he's the commander. He's, What's his character like? He's a commercial commander. He's the guy that, you know, if we can say that the VOC, the, the Dutch East Indies Company, was the first multinational corporation, in many ways the first company, well, Pelsart, I frame him, he was the first company guy. Right. He was a guy that was not a leader of men. He didn't arise to that position because he could lead men in battle or on the seas or anything he was a he was a function he started out as a minor functionary and they noticed this guy makes profits and you put him at the next rank he makes profits and he spent a long time in india which was another you know base a huge part of the dutch east indies trading and so this guy just rises through the ranks as a good company man. And he's not, he has no maritime expertise at all. And he's on the Batavia as the commander of the fleet. And so any time that there's any commercial operations in, happening, as, for example, when they got to the tip of South Africa, where Cape Town now lies, Table Bay, that's where they, the ships would stop and they would trade. They'd give them a few hoops and iron hoops and so forth, and they'd take six cattle on board and slaughter them. So in that kind of stuff. So when they get on the shore, the commander, Francisco Pelsart, he is in command. He's the representative, he's the chief executive, not the chief executive of the company, but the highest ranking official of the company on the ship. He's the boss. But he's not the, the skipper. Maritime. He's not the he's skipper. He's not the skipper. And that, so you've got this urbane Dutch yes. businessman as yes, the commander. Yes, exactly. But the skipper is, is it, a different kettle of fish. Well, the skipper is an old salt, Arian Jacobs. A few Dutch people have corrected me how to do it. I can do that one, Arian Jacobs. And he's an old sea salt. And he's a guy that uh, early 40s, but which is old, which is seriously old. He's been around, you know, there's not a whorehouse in the seven seas that he hasn't been to. A, you know, in that, in that sense, that, that's the sense that I get from him of an old salt who is a leader of men, but in a very rough fashion, hard drinking, um, Rough, rough man, as they as they were want to be. So he's a, a rough, tough customer, and he. You write that he and the record shows he and Pelsart, the businessman, mm. just hated each other's yes. guts, and they'd ha they'd hated each other's guts before they even got on the boat. Absolutely, because they'd had they'd had a they'd had a falling out uh, two years before. Uh, Arian Jacobs had been in charge of a ship, he'd been in command of a ship that had taken Pelsart from India back to Holland and he got drunk and Pelsart had found out about it and Bad tore, show and all that. tore yes. him apart for, right. dis for disgracing the company name. And so you've got this you've got this, well it's almost a natural conflict that's through the ages you've got the commercial commander and a maritime commander, and there is this inbuilt conflict between them. About Nerds and jocks, essentially. That's right. <laughs> Nerds and jocks. Uh, Pretty much that. Uh, on board the ship. So there's an inbuilt conflict. Now we're going, going to come to the central figure in this story, hmm. uh, a, a truly terrifying human being, a man called 
Geronimus Cornelius. Mm. What was his job on board the ship? I think of him as a Rasputin figure. You know, he every every account of him that you know leaps from the page at you at the documents and in the subsequent testimony, very charismatic, very silky. And a very, maybe a cross between, you mentioned Shakespeare before, I love the figure of Iago, and uh, I'm talking Hamlet, I think, <laughs> and so a cross between Rasputin and Iago. And he is, he is fleeing the authorities in Holland because he's been involved in this licentious cult put out by the painter Terentius. Okay, so there's this well-known, famous painter in Holland, Terentius, and he was a very good painter, but he was a part of an orgiastic cult. And a serious orgiastic cult. Seriously, like, a serious, right. or, serious, you know, orgy, orgy, orgy. Right, as in orgies, not, not, uh, that's, you mean literally so. I mean orgy, yeah. orgies. Right, so the, so Cornelius, uh, Geronimus Cornelius is a member of this, this cult that... Heretic, it's, a, it's, right. a, a, it's an heretic cult, and part of the... They, they, they're actually going out of their way to blaspheme. Yes, And offend all of that. the Bible. That's right, exactly. Uh, do as thou wilt should be the whole of the law kind of thing. And the yeah. core of it is this, that... If your God is so, or God is so omniscient and so so all powerful, well, He must also control that which is in my heart. Therefore, if I have a lustful thought in my heart, can't be anything wrong with that. God must have put it there. And so it was. He was. He, they were promulgating the view that there you can live live the way you want to live. No heaven, no hell. God, God's there, but God wouldn't have put this in our heart. So let's, you know, do whatever you like. Yes, and take no whatever conse- you like, and no consequences in the afterlife. Because God must have wanted you to do that if you want to do it. Exactly. And th- so that was the danger. And they were they were having orgies. They were wild drinking. There was blas- blasphemy, and it was it was viewed as a as a threat to the state. Effectively, if this if this were to take off, so yeah. they were hunted out. So in a, in now nowadays, you know, if, they, if you're hunting somebody, you know put it out on Interpol or whatever, this is the person we're looking for. In those days, the, the, the tentacles of authority didn't reach particularly to the maritime ports. And so Geronimus, desperate to get out of Holland because he's been pursued by the authority, Terentius, who is the leader of the cult, has already been thrown in the dungeon. So he's gone. You know, the authorities are coming. They're closing in. Get me out of here. So Geronimus, at the last instant, gets, because he's an educated man, he can read, he can write, he, and he, he's, you know, he'd be the highest educated man on the ship, practically. He gets on the ship as the under-merchant, and the under-merchant is pretty much Pelsart's number two. So after Pelsart, this guy, you know... Cause he's 2IC. He, two, he's 2IC, but the commercial 2IC, not the maritime 2IC. So he's not just been a member of this cult, he's a, he also has... A psychopathic temperament. Absolutely. And, but no one knows that just yet. I'm with Peter Fitzsimons at the moment, and Peter Fitzsimons has written the story of the Batavia, the Dutch ship that crashed onto a reef off the coast of WA way back in the year 1629. What followed from that with amongst the survivors is just one, simply one of the most gruesome tales of all time. It's, a, it's a absolutely Not just a, gruesome, though, is it? I mean, there's a well, lot there's to some it. redeeming in it. There's some, yeah. re- there's, a, there's, there's some redeeming moments in it as well. Not a lot, but there are some there. So on this ship, you've got the, the bureaucrats, uh, Pelsart, mm. who's the commander, the captain of the ship, who's a bit of a brute. Mm. Uh, An old sea salt. And Sixteen men on a dead man's chest kind of guy. Underneath all of them is this psychopath mm, who's, who's on the run, essentially. That's who's, right. Who's on, on the boat there. And beautiful women. You've got beautiful women on the boat, too. Yeah. Now, this brings us to Lucretia van der Meulen. Mm. Uh, she's, she was a famous beauty, wasn't she? She was a very beautiful woman. One of my favourite lines in the English language comes from Raymond Chandler. And he once said, yeah. he wrote, she was a blonde. A blonde for a bishop to kick a hole in a stained glass window for. <laughs> and that's, that, that is, you know, Lucretia was revered. Yeah, but something was wrong, like a tarantula on a slice of angel food cake. <laughs> you know, that's good. Yeah. That's good. I'm sorry, I've run out of chance. Yeah. So anyway, she comes aboard, and she's going out to Lucretia goes goes is going out to join her husband in the Dutch East Indies. So he's a bureaucrat out there. He's been away for two years. She gets on the ship with her maid, and again in the accounts, it, it, the um, she's in the accounts. Zwanti, the maid, has is said to have the most perfect bosom. Okay, so. She she was a, basically, I mean, a busty. Oh, can I use the word wench? Basically, if I'm going to be historical yeah, for the time. Fun, but, you know, she, yep. she, was a, she was a very, she was said to have the most perfect bosoms. So that, there they are on, on this boat, on, mm. the, on the Batavia, and they're, they're sailing. Uh, they've gone down past Africa, yes. down past Cape Town, and then they hit the Roaring Forties, and they're out and about. Meanwhile, a mutiny is being planned. Well, what happens 
was in Cape Town in Table Bay. Cable, Cape Town hasn't been quite invented yet. It's about 20 years before Cape Town starts. But in that community, they get to, they've been, they've been to sea all this time. And they pull into Table Bay to reprovision, get fresh water and all the rest of it. And Pelsard goes ashore. Pelsard goes ashore to do the trading. At last, Jacobs, the skipper, thank God that bastard's out of here. You know, last I can live the way well, I want to. That's right. right. So, he, so what he does, at this point, they're a part of a fleet, a fleet of six, six of them, of which the Batavia is the flagship, which has got the commandeur. So the commandeur is away. I, I love the French expression. You and I say, when the, uh, when the cat's away, the mice do play. The French expression is, quand le chat n'est pas là, les souris dansent. When the cat's away, the mice dance. And so the commander has gone ashore. Jacobs that night ties one on. He gets, he's been making a play. He has been making a play for Lucretia. Lucretia has no interest. Basically says, get your filthy paws off my silky drawers, as it were. I just, do declare. I do declare. Leave me alone. And just has no interest in him. So, so before they get to Table Bay, Jacobs has taken up with Zwanti. Okay. And, and we the maid, the maid, and there's a whole dynamic between Lucretia and Zwanti. But the point is this: by the time the ship pulls into pulls into Table Bay on the southern tip of Africa, Jacobs the skipper has made a play for Lucretia, who has said, "No, not now, not ever. Get away from me." So, in revenge, he's taken up with Zwanti, who has become the skipper's mistress. So this causes a terrible problems between Lucretia and Zwanti. But they get there, commanders on the on the shore for two days, and you beauty. Jacobs with Geronimus, who he's very friendly with, and with Zwanti, they get in their little rowboat and they go from ship to ship and they drink and they drink and they talk about the commander and they swear and they carry on. And Jacobs keeps drinking to the point that the skipper of one of the ships throws him off. He says, get, you know, get off my ship. And they've, he tries to fight and they put him in the rowboat and he goes to another one and he disgraces himself again. So he has you know, a pretty good night for a ship skipper. with Richard Feidler on ABC Local Radio and the World Wide Web. Writer, raconteur and journalist Peter Fitzsimons is with me at the moment. Peter's written a book called Batavia, which is a true story, the amazingly true story, of a ship by the same name, the Batavia, that sailed from Holland to go to the Spice Islands, as they were, and the citadel of Batavia, and hit a reef off the coast of WA in the year 1629. And what followed from that is absolutely one of the most hair-raising tales in human history, as he absolutely says. That is really no exaggeration, as it turns out. So they were f- the between the the ship's skipper and the psychopath Geronimus mm. on board the ship, while the captain was on shore in Africa, they were planning mutiny. That's right. So and, what, what and happens is Pelsart comes back and, and he's got gets these reports from these two skippers that your skipper, Arion Jacobs, has disgraced himself. So when Pelsart gets on board, he is furious and he humiliates the skipper in front of the crew, absolutely incandescent with rage. And so at this point, the skipper of the Batavia knows, because Pelsart's told him, when we get to the citadel of Batavia, I will see you in my office and we will sort a few things out. And the, the Dutch didn't muck around on that. If you, if you breach ship regulations, there, were, there was hell to pay. So as they head across the Indian Ocean, Jacobs knows if, if when, I get to, when I get to the citadel here, there'll be real trouble. If I'm thrown in the dungeon, I don't know. Oh, Geronimus right. gets into his ear and says... Let's get a mutiny going. Okay, okay now, so that both these men don't have much to lose no, at this point. No. Everything to gain by. And a down mutiny. below, they've got 12 money chests, and they've got. they And what they start to do is whispers on the waves at midnight. Get the mutiny going. Are you with us? Richard, you're with us. Here's the cutlass. I'll give you the order. When the time comes, and we've got him, and we've got him, and they build up 18 guys who are with them. And. There's a long, there's a, all right, can I tell you, the, it's a terrible story, but at one point on May, May the 5th, 1629, they've got 18 guys and they think we need more. The problem is the rest of the crew don't hate Pelsard enough. What are we going to do? Pelsart by this time has fallen ill and who's nursing him? Lucretia. Lucretia the beautiful woman is disappearing into Pelsart's cabin and they think, well Pelsart's close to Lucretia let's humiliate her. So they, the eight of them jump Lucretia 10 o'clock one night and exactly what happens here I have to be very clear in my account because it's not clear to me whether or not it's rape. But certainly they grab her, they rip her clothes off, they smear her with feces they hull and tar, they hold her over the side of the deck by her ankles. Whether she was sexually assaulted or not, I cannot make clear from the primary documents. 
they leave her in a crumpled heap. And their idea is that when Pelsard finds out, he will go absolutely wild and punish the ship in some manner until he finds out who's done this. Pelsart, by this point, has partially recovered and is canny enough to realise I'm, I'm, fl- I'm on a powder keg at this point. So they tried to goad him That's right. into being exactly. a tyrant. Exactly. And if they goaded him to that, then that would create a feeling that's of right. injustice amongst uh, the and crew. We'll, we'll get, and that's right. And if he, if he punishes or kill hauls people that haven't been involved, anyway, so what, the, what then happens is Pelsart holds his fire, realises I'm on a powder keg, and basically says, when we get close to Batavia, then I'll meet out my punishments. And it builds the tension tension on this ship as it's getting closer to the Australian shore is it's 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 seething with tension and so what then happens is Geronimus, they're getting closer. Geronimus and Jacobs, they're getting closer to Batavia. They're getting closer to their fate. They've got to do something. And here's the point of it. On the night of June 4, 1629, they think they're still 600 miles out to sea. So they don't think they're close to the Australian shore. And this mutiny is seething along, but hasn't yet broken out into the open. And at that night, at three o'clock in the morning, suddenly they hit the reef of the Abrolhos Islands. Again, there's historical discussion about whether or not you trace Abrolhos to the Portuguese Abrolhos Olhos, keep your damn eyes open, a literary lighthouse, but it was the Abrolhos Islands. And when the sun comes up, so it's obvious that the, from the moment that it hits that the ship is stricken and they cut down the mast, which is to try to, light, to try to lighten the load. When the sun comes up, they can see nearby two tiny, tiny islands. I've been to these islands, the Abrolhos Islands, they're part of the Abrolhos Islands. And what then happens is Pelsart takes control, more or less, with Jacobs, and they ferry people back and forth to the shore. And they establish on one of these islands, they get the repository, of the, they get the wine, the food that they can salvage, they get, one of the, they get one of the money chests, they get a lot of the textiles, and whatever they can salvage. And, and to speed it up a little bit, what happens then is you've got chaos on the shore. Not enough water, people crying out for water, for food. What's going to happen? And Pelsart takes... 47. Pelsart takes the key decision. I'll put 47 people in this longboat and I'll go for help. I'll go to the Australian shore to see if I can get water. If there's no water there, and he takes with him Jacobs. So Pelsart and Jacobs are suddenly out of the picture. The two, the, the leading commercial figure and the leading maritime figure, they go with 47 people, leaving Geronimus, the psychopath, in charge. He is the highest ranking one. He stays on the ship as it's battered back and forth for eight days, and he's the last one off the ship. He's the one in charge. That's right. On these two little islands. That's right. So you've been there. Describe these islands. They if are, you can even call them islands. I always wonder if I've got the right expression, but I call them puddles of land. I don't know if that quite works, but anyway, that's what I've come up with. Puddles of land. They're just tiny little flat tops, bit of, bit of tiny, you know, corally, tufty, disgraceful little islands. Do you know Is there what anything <laughs> growing on them at all? Is there grass? A little or? bit, a little bit. Not, it's not grass. No it's, trees? No, no, absolutely no trees. It's, it's sort of brackeny, sort of brackish, you know, like tiny little, sa- basically sad little shrubs would be how I'd describe it, with, with you know, very coarse sand and windy. You know, when the roaring 40s roar across the Indian Ocean in that part of the world, the first thing they hit is the Abrolhos Islands. And but when well, I must say now, I find them beautiful. I mean, they're they're, they're beautiful. But if you were, if you go, I love I love you know, I visit you bit, and I get to go back to the hotel in Geraldton. Yeah. <laughs> if you had to spend the night on the sand there, it'd be very grim. So the psychopath. Geronimus is left in charge of how many people roughly on About this island? About roughly 250, 240 in the first instance. 30 drowned. There were 331. 20 or 30 drowned in the first in the first spot. Um, by the time he washed it, well, but so then 40, 48, 47, 48 go for help, as it were. And eight of them, I think, have died of thirst by the time he washes ashore. The commander, the skipper, have gone mm. to go and get help. And the psychopath is in charge. That's right. How does he assume control? What unfolds there? Because Peter? he's there's all the force of the company. He is the highest ranking official of the company. And he comes ashore and he's hailed as the hero, the under merchant, the under cookman, as they call him. The under merchant is here. How does he go to begin with in organising the settlers? Well, he, much food or he, water? he asserts he asserts control, he says, and they hail him, we need a leader. I am that leader. There has been... The Dutch were very big. They were the ones invented committee meetings. They were very big on having council 
councils to decide. And there was a council of the predicant um, and various of the senior officials. He takes over that council. They invite him to become a part of that council. And so it's very, it's very Iago-like. There is this council, the under merchants, the obvious man to lead that council. He leads that council. And for the first week or two, he establishes control. Dig the latrines. We'll have, every, we'll have, we'll have all the stores in my... We, we've got to have control of these stores. They'll all be in my tent. I want all the weapons in my tent. I'm going to need some people to guard them. I'll take, oh, you 18 men. So he puts his men, the guys that were the mutineers, gravitate to him. He installs them as almost the Praetorian Guard. So suddenly he's got the political power because he's got the force of the company behind him. He's got the muscle, who've got the weaponry. And what happens then is within a week or two, he realises and he says to the mutineers, look, we've got 240, 250 odd people here. We've got limited food, limited wine. We'll be eaten out of house and home. We'll die. We're going to have to kill them. And he, well, they can't just unleash the forces against the other 240. What he does very cleverly, he divides and conquers. So he says to one man, you take 20 people over to this nearby island, which they can see, Seal Island, which is a low, flat strip of very sandy island. Um, and you live there, and we'll bring you food when we need it. Now he says to the, to the other man, you take 14 down to what became known as Traitors, uh, Traitor, Traitors Island. Um, and the, the key one is, he says to a man called Webby Hayes, this guy Webby Hayes, who from out of nowhere has no rank as a soldier. He's not a corporal. He's not, he's not a sergeant or any rank whatsoever, but he's a, he's a quiet leader. And in this crisis, he has come to the fore. And the other soldiers are gravitating to him. So, so Geronimus recognises in this guy a threat. Right, what are we going to do? So he sends out his vicious henchman, David Zavank, to an island five miles away and says, come back and tell me if there's water on it. Zavank comes back and says, I've looked at it, there's no water. You beauty. First time in the history of Australia anybody said, you bloody beauty. So Geronimus sends for Webby Hayes and says to him, right, take your 20 best men, go over to the high island, there's lots of water there. We'll drop you off on the barge, we'll leave you with barrels, and uh, once you fill them, send up three plumes of smoke. So off he goes, and Geronimus thinks, that's the end of him, there's no water, they'll just die a miserable death. And what happens is... Webby Hayes, uh, they live off puddles, they can't find any water, they go inland and they find what they call in the journals bouncing cats, you and I know as wallabies. Suddenly they've got a food supply, okay, but they've got some puddles of water that they survive and Webby Hayes walks, gets the men and they systematically search the island and they're walking across this rock plateau, the most unlikely place to find water and I've been there, you look at it, it just looks arid. They're walking across and they hear something it sounds hollow. And it's, it's a funny, it's like, you know when you see Aboriginal carvings, sometimes there are rocks upon it. It's like that. There are no Aboriginal carvings. But when you shift this rock aside, suddenly you look and there is this natural well about six feet deep. Uh, and you look down uh, it, you can see your face in it. So they found water. Is it, is it seawater or is it fresh water? They lower down a cup. They lift it up. It's fresh water. You beauty. So now you've got the situation. Webby Hayes on this island has got 20 men, he's got food, he's got water. Meantime, carnage is taking place back on Batavia's yeah, graveyard. Now the tell me about that, because Geronimus now has all of his threats out of the way. That's right. And, he, and, and he, then he reveals himself. And he has a plan, an absolute plan, to reduce the population of the island. So he sends his thugs out to Seal Island, kill them all. So they kill them all. Some of them get away in the middle of the night. He sends them out to Traders Island, kill them all. None of them got away. In fact, they tried, well, they tried to get away and they were massacred midstream. Anybody, and in the meantime, he trumps up charges against people on the island saying, you've been stealing the property of the company. And you can imagine, here you and I are, Richard, we're, we're two sailors just trying to get about our business. We're in our tent at midnight. We've got no weapons. Geronimus is in charge. And they could see in the midnight and the howling wind. It's a really, really strong wind there. And you see the lanterns coming, lanterns, men. They've got weapons and they've got lanterns. Whose tent are they going to? Oh, they're not going to ours. They're going to the tent next door. You've got the property and the goods of the company. And, the, you know, and this is all, this is, I'm not embellishing. This, you know, this had happened time and again. They just picked them off and picked them off. They said, we didn't need 25 women. They had five women who were kept as women of common service. So sexual slaves, basically. Lucretia, meantime, is taken to Geronimus's tent, refuses to sleep with Geronimus until three weeks in. It's explained to her by David Zavank. You either do the right thing here or the wrong thing or you'll die. And so she becomes Geronimus's concubine. So what happens is this massacre is taking place in Batavia's graveyard. The, the, there are refugees, however. They get away. 
they get away and they get on bits of wood and they get to Webby Hayes' island. So Webby Hayes, over the next few weeks, builds up his numbers to 50 good men and true, who are 30 of whom have come from Batavia's graveyard, who say to Webby Hayes, Geronimus is massacre, murder, they're killing us. And they also realise, Webby Hayes realises that if they've gone for, come for them in the other islands, they'll come, come for, for us. They'll come for us, which gets us to the climactic part. You barely let me get a word in it. Yeah, I know. I, know. <laughs> I just wanted to ask you before you do that, though, an example of how... Cause this is the creepiest part mm. of the story for me. Geronimus the psychopath would, would mentally manipulate people... Yes. Uh, people to, uh, weak, of weaker mind to do things they would never in a million years no. contemplate doing. And the one that haunts me most is uh, is Andres de Fras, and he was a 25-year-old sailor, not a good man, not a bad man, just a man, just a, you know, just a man. Anyway, they're about, he's about to be murdered. He's with two companions, and they've been they, his two companions are trussed up and thrown into the water. And David Zavank puts his foot on them in the shallows and drowns them. And they're about to do the same to Andres de Vries. And he says, no, 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 I'll do anything, I'll do anything. I say, really? Any, yes. They take him to Geronimus, all documented. Geronimus says to him, look, Andres, terribly sorry about that unpleasantness out there. These are, these are tough times. You, you said you'd do anything. Yes. All right. Well, will you do this? We've got a problem with the sick tent. We've got 11 people in the sick tent. They are drinking the water. They're eating the food and they're going to die anyway. We need somebody to go in there tonight with this dagger, slit their throats. We'll teach you how to do it. Will you do that for us? You'll be doing a great service for us. And Andres says, yes. And that night, like a Shakespearean play, it's what makes me think of. They take him to the tent. They give him the dagger. He goes in. He comes out 20 minutes later with the blood dripping, dripping from his dagger. He's a shattered man. And he wanders around like a zombie for the next two days. And they make him go and do it again. And he kills another three because there's another three in the sick tent. And then he makes, of all his errors, the worst error, he, he figures he's been close to Lucretia. She's the only one that can understand. You know, she's the only one that'll understand what I've been through. So he goes to talk to her, and breaking the golden rule, Geronimus has said, nobody speaks to my woman. Nobody speaks to Lucretia. He spotted speaking to Lucretia. They chase him down, and they kill him. And so there's that kind of stuff. The death of the Predicants family is also shattering the brutality of it. And what would happen to him? Because he's a minister of religion, and all this this is breaking out, mass murder. And 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 what's he doing? And this is the other thing. They've got these blood oaths, basically, where they sign with each other. We're all together. We're all with Geronimus. He's the commander and we'll all be together. And the numbers of mutineers swell. So here you are, Richard, you're a good man, but you can see good men are dying. Mutineers are dressing in velvet. They're eating the wine. They're going to the, the tents of the women with common service. The ranks of the mutineers swell until they've got 40 or 50 of them, the mutineers who are living well. And so the, what happens to them is, and here's the interesting thing with the predicant. The predicant goes to dinner, the preacher with his beautiful daughter, with Geronimus. Geronimus has given orders to his men, go to the tent where the predicant's wife is with the other five children and kill them. He comes back, and this happens time and time again. He comes back, he realises what's happened, they've massacred them. What does he do? He knows, he knows that if I go back and try to tear the throat out of Geronimus, whose throat so desperately deserves to be torn out, I'll be dead. Within a few days of his family being massacred by Geronimus, he signed, you know, in the blood oath, he's with them. Oh. So you've got this situation. And I'll guess he's I'm, ruined. He's ruined. He's ruined. He's, he's, ru- he's morally ruined a lot of them. Well, not a lot of them because some stand up. But here's the point. And he admitted to all that in his letter then, didn't yes. he? Yes. Well, no, he's, he, he, uh, he's that's skirted what, that, around that, that stuff, He skirted he? around that stuff, but that's in the Predicant's journal because that came out in the testimony. So what happens then is this. You've got the situation of reign of terror on Batavia's graveyard, this tiny little island. You've got 50 good guys over under the leadership of Webby Hayes on the high island five miles away. Now, the rescue yacht, both sides are thinking, if the rescue yacht comes back, that's going to be operative. That's going to be the thing that counts because Geronimus wants to get off the island and the only way they can do it is to slit the throats of anybody in the rescue yacht that comes. The problem is the rescue yacht will come from the northeast, meaning it'll, it'll come by Webby Hayes Island. So here's the key. Webby Hayes has realised this. Geronimus has understood it. We're going to have to kill the men on Webby Hayes' island. So he sends in he sends in his guys with the muskets and the swords, thinking it'll just be a turkey shoot, well, the, the ancient equivalent of a turkey shoot. They've, they've killed them on Seals Island. They've killed them on the uh, Traders' Island. So they send them in. Meantime, Webby Hayes and 
he's he's a military man and he's got them and he's worked out and I've been there there is only one place you can properly approach that island through the shallows and he's got his guys now there's in the ancient accounts there's a there's a phrase that sounds like they built the predicant describes it the phrase it's it's not like a catapult but it was such contraptions of such ingenuity I could not believe now okay so Webby Hayes and his men mm. on that island they have no muskets no they have no weaponry at all no. Well, well, well. No, no modern, no, no modern weapon. No what modern... weapons are they able to make okay. for themselves well, while they, they're on that island? They have, they have got artisans and they've got carpenters, people who are good with their hands. They've got some driftwood, and they've got, they've got. Uh, basically a few bits and pieces they took with them. So for the barrels, for example, the barrels, that well, the water, they use the iron off that. And what they're able to do, they're able to shar- they're able to get, get bits of iron, put them in the end of long bits of driftwood, and they make themselves pikes. They can carve these things on sharp stones. They can make, they can make uh, like daggers, cutlasses, not really cutlasses. What I really tried to get up, and it killed me not to be able to get it up, is the account, by the account of the predicant, he said such... Such such contraptions of ingenuity like you cannot imagine. So I, I, I go there. I'm looking for uh, a sign. Catapults I'm, I want, or slings. Well, that's what slings, I wanted. I wanted um, to yeah. be, I wanted. I think slings, but I wanted it to be a catapult or I wanted it to be a bit of driftwood that you could put in a crack in the cliff and go pull it back and spring right. it. When you go there, sadly for me, it's not possible. So so, so there we are. We've got we've got our hobbits yep. led by Webby Hayes on that's this right. on this island and the and the forces of Mordor and Sauron essentially. That's exactly <laughs> what happens. Are, are coming to. Kill them all. That's right. So they can get to the rescue yacht first. Okay. What happens when they try to okay. assault the island of the good they guys? Are, they approach. The baddies are approaching the goodies, and they're they're within fifty yards of getting to these tiny. It's like a two meter cliff that you've got to scale, and you have to go through the shallows, and it's difficult. They got their muskets out. They're they're getting there. They're under the orders of Geronimus, who'll never dirty his own hands, and they're getting close. When suddenly. <laughs> Rocks whizzing, whizzing past their ears, hitting them. Ah, drop the musket. Ah, that's wet. That's gone. Splashing. The water comes up over the muskets. They try to fire the muskets. Guns out as wet, right? Gun yeah. And they look up, right. and there are Webby Hayes's men charging at them out of the cliffs through the shallows, and they turn tail and they run. So they're beaten off in that first attack, a victory for the goodies. And here we're getting to the point. This happens. Geronimus is infuriated, sends them in again for the second time. Again, they're beaten back. Sends them in the third time. Again, they're beaten back. And at this point, this is a bit, bit convoluted, but Geronimus gets taken prisoner at a certain point. But the climax comes on September 17, 1629 when there's an all-out attack from the baddies, led by a guy called Wuta Luz, who's also got a military mind. And this time, the baddies are winning, OK? And they're, they're, they're going methodically. They're not rushing in. They know by this time stones will come at them. And they fire alternately on their muskets. And they kill one of Webby Hayes' men up on the clifftops. He falls. They kill another. They kill another. This battle goes on for three hours. And here is the part that most people can't believe. It is in the documents. This is what happened. At the height of this battle, just when the forces of Geronimus and Wutaloos are about to win the day, at that instant, the rescue, the sail of the rescue yacht appears. And at that point, both, both the baddies and the goodies realise who gets to the rescue yacht first <laughs> wins. And it's, it is effectively, no joke, it probably, unless the Aborigines were prone to do it, it's the first serious boat race in Australian history because there's this wild, Webby Hayes takes off. He's, he's secreted his own boat on the other side of the island. So he races with three... So, so they just drop everything, do they? Drop everything. In the it's battle, about, to it's, get into the it's boat. now right. about the rescue yacht. Right. Who can get to the rescue yacht? So, Ger- so meantime... Pelsart, you know, he's desperate to get back. And he's thrilled to see a plume of smoke, meaning there's life. And he pulls in to this little cove on one of the high islands, and they go ashore, and then you know, they look, and he can see a boat racing towards him. What's going on? And everybody, all these men, what's happening? And he recognises this guy, Webby Hayes, who was, you know, a junior burger from the lowest chain, who's there, but he seems to be in command. And he says to, he says to Pelsart, he says, quick, quick, they'll be coming, they'll be coming, get back to the yacht, get back to the yacht, quick. And so... Pelsart takes takes a chance. He sounds right, and so they get back onto the yacht just in time to see Wooter Lose racing towards them in his in his in his in his boat, and he can see that they're armed. And so Pelsart says to his men on the yacht, "Everybody on my on my signal, go." But let's see what they've got to say. And so when they when when Wooter Lose and his thugs pull up, his murderers pull up. 
Pelsart says, why have you come with weapons? And, and Wooterloo says, we want, to, we want to come aboard. We want to talk to you. And at that point, Pelsart gives the order. And suddenly, just like in any Hollywood movie, but this happened, the men in the lower boat look up and there is, there is these rifles, these muskets pointed down at them. And one other thing, there is nothing so black as the black of the muzzle of a cannon that is pointed to you, <laughs> pointed at you, you know, while you're in the ship. And they drop their weapons. So, and the other thing I'd love... They, in mm. the accounts, in the accounts, they drop them over the side. And I'd uh. love to think that there's a pile of rust or, you know, there must be some... Uh, and that spot, you can almost put the spot where that happened. I don't know if it's been properly searched. On the Abrolhos Island. Oh, Island. So, so what happens is he, Pelsart's men take control. They go to the island, they, they, they round up the baddies, they bring Geronimus, and they begin a trial. And this trial goes for weeks. Where, where did they hold this trial? On the ship? On, on the ship. On, on the rescue on the, ship. Some of it on the ship and some of it on the shore. Lucretia is still alive, and this is the fascinating thing. At the end of this trial, it's, it's an early version of waterboarding. What they do is, in, under Dutch law, you couldn't, you couldn't have capital punishment unless there'd been a full confession. So they put canvas around their neck. They pull the canvas up to the top of their head so that your head is at the bottom of a canvas bucket, and then they start to pour in water. And the only way you can survive is to drink. So you go, mm, mm, did you do it? Mm, no. Mm, 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 yes, I did it. Let me breathe. Let me breathe. And it was grotesque. But they, all of them gave these full confessions where they accuse each other. And so the first guy that says, no, I didn't do anything. Geronimus says, no, I didn't do anything. Well, five guys came in and he made me do this and he made me do that. And so at the end of it, they decide nine of them shall die. And this is the fascinating thing of the many fascinating things is other countries, when they were colonised, when the European powers or other powers got there, they got to get cathedrals built or they got pyramids or they got viaducts or roads. We got the first European construction on Australian soil was a set of gallows. So over on Seal Island, on Seal Island, they construct this set of gallows. They take Geronimus and the eight others over there, the worst of the murderers. And it's not simply to be hung. There was a, there was a ranking. Some of them were, first of all, he will have his, he, he can be hung. Others you have your left hand cut off and then you'll be hung. Geronimus was to have both, both, both of them cut off. And then hung. And when they when they hauled Geronimus up to the top of the of the ladder against the gallows, and both of his bloody hands stumps, so they've just cut them off, and they put the put the noose around his neck, and they're about to kick the ladder out. And his last words, all documented, were revenge. And then they kill him. And Whoa! They, <laughs> there, there will never revenge. be there will never be a better story. Peter, how many innocents? Men, women, and children. 125. Had he, 125 he, were killed. He'd, he'd been responsible for the but, murder of yes. 125 people on these little puddles of island mm. off the coast of WA. And, but very similar to Charles Manson. Charles Manson never killed anybody physically. Oh, he cut no one's no, throat. He didn't cut, any, cut, cut anybody's throat. He was he was sending his men to do the stuff. He was establishing a culture whereby it could be done. And he was saying, he kept saying to Pelsat, "I didn't do it. I didn't do it." Was this a scandal when it when news of it got back to Holland? Well, this is I. I when I, when I went to Holland and, you know, I was working with Dutch historians and I go to the archives, the National Archives at The Hague, and I say, you know, it had been, it'd been lined up that I get to see Pelsart's Journal. They take me to this room and they bring in Pelsart's Journal. For me, who's in love with the story, I, I just, I say, this is fantastic. I, you know, it's all in Dutch and you can see his spider hand. And they would just turn to go, I said, just excuse me, I'm delighted that you're trusting me with this, but I can't help but feel that this should be, I should be watched by six men with guns and this should be under glass. And, you know, I should be having silken white gloves before I'm allowed to touch it. And they said, basically, son, we've had a lot of wrecks. <laughs> <laughs> What a great yarn. Peter, uh, thanks for coming in and telling this great story. I didn't know this uh, until... I didn't know this. And, and people in Western Australia know it, and it hasn't really travelled too far. To the East Coast. I've dedicated the book to the three Australian writers who did most. Henrietta Drake Brockman, Hugh Edwards, uh, who did Island of Angry Ghosts, Max Kramer, who was the first to dive on it, using the stuff from uh, from, from uh, Hugh Edwards. Um, there's another very good book by Michael Dash, 12 or so years ago. But what I wanted to do was to make it live and breathe. The book is called Batavia. It's the true story of the ship by the same name, written by Peter Fitzsimons. Peter, thank you so much for returning to Conversations today. Thank you.